but I had to sell a lot of my records <laughs> to actually DJ, to pay the cab to go and DJ. So I went to Record and Tape Exchange when you take your records in and you can get some money or you can get some fake money and you can buy some other records with this bullshit money that they give you, right? So I came in with like a bag of, of shit, right? So I went in there and uh, the guy was like, all right, I can give you uh, 200 pounds or 500 pounds exchange money to spend in my shop. I need the 200 pounds, right? I'm broke, I need the 200 pounds. He's about to give me the 200 pounds and I look up on the, look up on the top there and he's got this record for 500 pounds of this is guy playing bongos. <laughs> and I look at him and I'm like, man, that must, that, what's that record like? And he's going, that's, that's the dope, that's the fucking rest. Can I have that? I'll have that. <laughs> so I spent 500 pounds on one record and I took it home. And so I thought, all right, man, it's going to have some breaks on it, right? It's going to have something on it. And I played it. And it was one um, continuous loop of a guy playing bong bongos. That was it. I don't even know what the record's called either, man. Don't buy it. <laughs> it's shit. Yeah, so yeah, that's my story. I'm Jaguar Skills and this is Crate Diggers. War of the Worlds, I used to listen to this as a kid a lot and um, it really inspired my kind of mixtape pr uh, production because it was like a whole fake story but put into a radio show about an alien man and it was so well done that it just really stuck in my head, you know, and like, and I just thought, Sh man, if I could do something where there's a character and, and there's a whole world there and you think it's real, but it's not. I love that. I love that, man. It's like, you don't know what I look like, I could be anyone, you know. I don't, you don't need to know what I look like because it's, the, it's my production and it's my music that should, it's what, all I want you to know about. Because the rest of it, I'm telling you now, it's <laughs> a documentary. Like, I'm a fucking ninja, man. That's why I wear, wear a mask, man. That's what it is. <laughs> I don't need to explain it. I guess it was my dad, you know, like when I was growing up, he was a DJ and uh, he was on the radio a lot and he was producing a lot of shows. He would have like record sales and people would come buy records around the house. My whole house was covered in records and I'd, I'd somehow kind of memorized a lot of the covers from just walking around and looking at them all. So he used to give me the records and ask if he had any doubles of the records and I'd never heard any of them, but I'd remember the covers, you know. So I used to just go through them. I had this kind of photographic memory of the covers. And uh, yeah, so I used to like from five till about 12, I used to sell records with him around the house. It was only like maybe four years into it that I started using all these records in my house. Like I was walking past them like, it's like that. It's like a weird multicolored wall, isn't it? And you, and just, you don't even know what's hidden within. That's what my whole house was like. Just like, I just remember as a kid, just walking past this shit. And, and maybe because there was so much that I actually didn't hear any of it. It was quite weird, really. So I, I only kind of discovered it in my teenage, even though I knew loads of the covers and everything. And the funny thing was as well, is that he didn't even really like music. He was into politics, so he was kind of collecting them, just like as a collector would collect things. These are the kind of things that I grew up listening to. Stuff like this, strange drum break records, you know? This is a bit like the record that I spent 500 pounds on, but this is actually better. It was quite weird, because I had so many records in the house, and I don't know what it was, it was like I wanted to buy my own records, you know, so I started buying a lot of hip hop stuff and then going back into my dad's collection and finding the breaks and the samples that they used. That's how I started, that's how I started kind of digging for records and stuff. Buying the records, looking at the back of the sleeves and then going into my dad's collection and finding out that he had all the samples that they used. So then that kind of got me into funk and jazz and soul and all the other shit. But it was from hip hop that I kind of found the art of, of digging. And, then, and then, I, then I really went crazy, you know, like going to a, car boot sales and flea markets and like 
anywhere. I mean, I added that to that, maybe 10,000 more records to that collection, you know. These kind of joints, Music Dwarf and Bruton Music and also KPM were the ones that I was really trying to dig for and find because you would get songs on the back, like they wouldn't even be called names, like they would, but they would just have like, a powerful, prestigious, contemporary theme with a emotive rhythm to button end. It would just tell you what it is uh, in a nice descriptive way. And like some of them are only like 10 seconds long and stuff. Great little stings and stuff to sample. Really rare, very rare. Like when there was the whole kind of independent hip hop movement going on and Wu-Tang came out and there was a lot of, loads of independent vinyl flying around. That was a really real exciting time for me in record shop hunting, you know, record shopping. And, and, and this was Cannabis. There was this MC called Cannabis in the 90s. And he was amazing. And these were his radio freestyles that he did, but they pressed them up on vinyl. And um, oh, I love this, man. This is amazing. And I think that he did something with Mr. C and a few other guys, maybe DJ Clue. But they pressed up on vinyl. And I love that, and it's very rare. I went to my friend's uh, birthday party, my friend was DJ, and I just thought, F man, I could, I, I could do this. <laughs> That's what it was like, he was playing some really, like, everyone was bugging out by this record that he was playing, and I forgot what it was. And I thought, man, I've got the remix of that at home, and I've got the fuck this and that, and this guy's the cool dude, and where's, I've got all these 40,000 records at home, man. Come on. So then I did a couple of house parties and that was what it was. And it was like the, the vibe of uh, when you play a record and you, t you freak someone out, you know, that was, that was my mission. I never thought about a superstar D or even getting paid for it or anything. It was like the idea of putting a record on and freaking somebody out and having them dance to some weird record that I've put on. That was my kind of kick. I would play soundtracks and then I started playing disco and then I started playing some hip hop and then some drum and bass maybe, and all types of different stuff. When I was listening to all my records at home and stuff, I never used to listen to one style because there were so many different stuff to listen to, you know? So I ended up playing all types of different stuff all the time, and that's what I kind of got uh, kind of known for now. This was a cool joint that I used to play a lot. It was a real famous house sample here anyway, Dance With You. And it was one of those records where I heard the house record and I knew exactly where it came from, from my dad's collection, so I went and got it, and then played it, started DJing it, and everyone's like, oh, holy shit!" Like, this is another one. This groove is bad. This is amazing. See, why don't I have album covers like this anymore, you know? With spaceships and tight trousers. So I used to DJ from like seven until uh, like three in the morning, right? So you don't want to hear any like banging shit at seven, right? So I would play just soundtracks and weird versions of tunes. I'd feel like I was the man for the weirdest version of a theme tune, you know? Like, so I've got like maybe eight different Star Treks. And I would play the original Star Trek and then it would get into like a porn version of Star Trek, you know, like a 70s funk porn version. And then like a disco version. I've got like a rock one as well. Like all these crazy different versions. I used to bug people out and, and especially when it was vinyl. And you, and you were DJing, and that was the only thing that you could play music from. You were gauged by how deep your record collection was, you know. You had to go out and dig for records, right? You couldn't just go on the internet and get them. So if I was to play all these crazy versions, I'd just have all these DJs next to me, like, looking through my shit, like, what the f***, where the f*** do you get this shit? So, like, Jeff Love and his orchestra were really cool at doing, like, some real pimped-out 70s funk versions of your very favourite favorite uh, film songs. So the Jaws on this is just next level. And the Death Wish has got like incredible drum break on it. Yeah, Jeff Love again, like Shaft, like all of these times, like weird funk disco versions. Weird, strange, like this cat here, Jason King, man. His theme, theme tune is ill. Yet again, Jeff Love and his orchestra, like Hawaii Five-O. It's just amazing. It's got like this four minute drum break solo in it. It was as if they, they knew about hip hop and sampling before it was even invented, you know what I mean? They knew that this tune shit 
But if I put a four minute drum break on there, it's going to be worth something in the future. I used to do a lot of, you call them flea markets, right? We call them car boot sales. There was this one in the middle of nowhere in this town, in this countryside, and I was driving past it. I was addicted to buying records, right? So I thought, shit, I can just pull in here, man, and check it out. So I was walking around and, the, and they were shutting, it was shutting down because I was late. So I'm walking out and there's this guy selling like some toys and some like plants or some shit and some like footballs or some shit like that. And then there was this plastic bag next to him here, right? And I'm, walk, and I'm walking past, the, at the entrance is here, I'm walking past and I see this guy and I see this plastic, I see this plastic bag and it's got records in it. All right, let me just go and check this out. And I go, and I go in this, and I'm looking at these records, right? And they're like, it's like all the library records, like the rare, you couldn't even get these records. They were like in the 70s and they were given to TV producers and, uh, and directors, whatever, for background music. But in the 70s, uh, but these records were like the rarest, man. They were like the most, they were KPM green label vinyls, right? with the funkiest shit you've ever heard that no one else has ever heard and it's, you could sample it as well. And this guy had the entire collection in a plastic bag next to him. And I'm, I'm looking through and I'm like, you crazy, you kidding me? And it's maybe about that. And I said, where did you get these? He was like, my uncle uh, used to work in TV. I found them in his, in the basement. I go, how much are you selling these for? Uh, three pounds? I'm like, all right then, done. Yeah. It was the treasure that I'd been looking for for years, all in one place, you know, for three pounds. Compton. Just because I just thought, what a, what a title, man. You don't get records like this anymore, man. Really politically incorrect and wrong in loads of many ways. Rather than the kind of vinyl itself, it's going into a record shop and finding your, the record that you want and then going up and paying for it. It's like, like when I used to go to record shops, man, it was like going into the most extreme club in the world with like the guys selling the records were like doormen, you know, like bouncers. And you had to get their attention and then they might not even sell you the record. And then they might give you a like, no, you don't want this record, you want this record, right? Here you go, buddy. And it was real difficult to ever, and scary as as well, you know, like going into some real crazy old school reggae shops and trying to buy reggae there. It's just difficult, man. And so you really had to have some balls of steel to go into some of these record shops. And now you can just get it on the internet and you don't have to go to a record shop. And it kind of takes out the excitement, I guess, or just fear or something. I don't know what it was. It was a mixture of excitement and fear and, and uh, of finding the record and scared of the guys who own the record shop, but pretty, pretty much. My dad had the uh, first Beatles album signed, all signed by everybody. And we were broke at the time as well, right? So we had to sell this record and he gave all the money to, the, to a nunnery uh, down the road. And it was 15,000 pounds that we sold it for. But yeah, I did, we didn't get the money. It was the nuns got it. <laughs> Why well, didn't give it to my mum? My mum was crazy. She was like, what the f***? Anyway. Mm -hmm.